Okay, so this month uh, we're going to have a shorter presentation and we've had some long ones recently. Uh, so we're going to talk about solving some common problems with the components in Boost Utility. And Boost Utility is kind of an odd little library in Boost. It's kind of a collection of random things that are useful but not large enough to have a library of their own or not cohesive enough in concept to be joined into another library so it's kind of a grab bag of of stuff which we'll see so um, if we look over at its documentation um, we're going to talk about base from member we're going to talk about call traits we're going to talk about compressed pair talk about in place factory and operators now you notice in here some things that have consequently appeared in the C++ standard, namely binary integer literals and string view. Uh, result of, I believe, has also made it into the standard library. So we won't talk about those. Um, Boost has been around for quite some time. You can see the copyright date on this page is 2001. So this, some some components of this uh, library have been around for almost 25 years at this point. Um, so let's take a look at some code. I am pulling in Boost Utility as a dependency through VC Package. Uh, pretty much standard stuff using a VC Package manifest. And let's drag this over here so you can see this. And I've created a, a simple little example uh, for each one of these facilities. Now. Uh, let's just go back here to the documentation, take a look at each of these in turn. So base from member, what problem is this solving? Well, suppose as, uh, let's make this a little bigger. Suppose as in this example, you're trying to initialize an O stream from the standard library from a stream buff, but your stream buff is a member and it depends on, you've got a, a stream buffer class that is built around an, a, a POSIX file descriptor. So it's a, it's a, the stream buff is the thing that actually does the reading and the writing for a, a stream. And so the stream buff is going to be the thing that if it's an input stream, in this case it's an output stream, so we'll just restrict our discussion of that. It's going to call write on the file descriptor with a pointer to its buffer and when the buffer is flushed. And when the buffer gets flushed uh, and filled is controlled by the OStream class. So this is a standard separation in the standard library between a stream buff and a stream. Now, our class, this FDO stream, derives from OStream in order to override the interface of an O stream so that an, an FDO stream is an O stream. So anywhere we could use an O stream, we could use this FDO stream. The problem is that base classes are initialized before members. And we're trying to initialize our base class with a pointer to a member, but that member needs to be initialized from an argument to our constructor. So this isn't going to work correctly because this object, which is a member in our class, as shown here, hasn't been completely initialized when the base class is initialized. So the trick to solve this problem is to create another base class that gets initialized before the OStream base class so that when OStream is initialized, it's the, the inputs to the OStream constructor are completely uh, initialized and well-defined. And that's what base from member does. Now, um, you could do this manually, and they show an example of how you would do this with a custom base class. Um, but if you're doing this over and over, it gets to be annoying. So base from member 
uh, if we go down to their example here where they're using this uh, and we'll look at a real example in just a second so here they are deriving from base from member of FD outbuff and then that mem that base class will get initialized before OStream because base classes are initialized in the order that they're inherited from in the class declaration so this FD outbuff will get it properly initialized and then we can use um, this address of member member is provided by this base from member from boost so this address of member gets uh, it, it is properly initialized um, before we initialize the O stream. So rather than talk about this kind of from abstract example, let's go look at, at the concrete example based on this. Uh, so uh, let's make this guy the start project. So when we run it, this is what we're running. Now I just went out to um, the idea of a stream buff from a file descriptor was just kind of sketched out in that boost documentation. I went out and found on a, a, a gist on GitHub an implementation of a stream buff that oper it, it operates from a file descriptor. So we're going to do that that example that was sketched out we're going to do it for real. So here I've got my FDO stream. It's deriving from boost base from member of FT stream buff so this will be the type of the member variable here that's initialized in this class so this is a template class if we drill into that we see that it's a template class where the um, there's a member type and that uh, if we just ignore all this um, macro stuff here we can see that there's a protected member of that type called member. So when we take this address, the type of this is the type of the template argument. So it's FD stream buff. And that's what we, we need to have this stream buff initialized before we can use its address to initialize the O stream. We're going to initialize the stream buff from the integer file descriptor number that we're passing in and uh, base from member if we look at inside this we can see that it initializes member from the stuff that was passed in here it's using um, <coughs> a template pack here so it's a pack so that the uh, initializing expression can be you know a, it's a variable argument template um, you can see here that this constructor of base from member is itself a template member function and it takes an arbitrary uh, number of types those types are deduced from the arbitrary number of arguments to the constructor so in our case we just have a single type a single argument it's an int so base from member gets a signature in its uh, for its uh, template constructor here that takes a single int and it uh, forwards that single int onto the constructor for the held member type which in our case is this FD stream buff so the end result is that we can instantiate that O stream and then use it just like any other O stream if we run this program I had a little debugging breakpoint there that we don't need anymore but uh, you can see that this is going to standard out file descriptor 1 was the output of the program and that's what we were sending here I was debugging it earlier because I forgot that file descriptor 1 is standard out file descriptor 0 is standard in I was trying to I was trying to write to standard in that wasn't gonna work so um, this base from member the whole purpose is to help you get around order of initialization problems when you have a base class that needs to be initialized from something but the thing it needs to be initialized from is a member in your class so you move it and move that member into a base class that you inherit from before the 
the dependent uh, base class. So in this case, the dependent base class is O stream, stood to O stream, so that you can get the order of initialization to work in your favor. So like in most things, computer science, the problem is solved by adding an extra layer of indirection. So that's pretty straightforward. But you can see it's kind of like there, there's some semi-fancy machinery here. I mean, this is a template class, but it's in turn got a template constructor on it. And it's a var args template so that the uh, arguments to the constructor of your nested class get properly forwarded on, right? So it's just kind of a pain if you had to write that yourself. Uh, so being able to use that from Boost can solve that problem when you run into it. Now, let's look at our, our next little component here. We'll go back over to the documentation. Uh, we're going to skip binary integer literals because that was added to the standard, so we don't need uh, a library for that. Um, but we're going to look at call traits. So if you start writing generic functions or generic classes, so template functions or template classes, you start bumping into the problem that you've written your signature of your template function to accept an argument and you've accepted it in some way like maybe you took the template type t maybe you took it by value so the argument is declared as just a plain old t but not everything is efficient to pass as copy by value right that's fine for things like ints floats that occupy a single word but if you're passing a heavy uh, data structure into this generic function, you don't want to make a whole copy of it. Say like a map with a hundred thousand, uh, a map of string to string with a, a hundred thousand entries in it. You don't want to be creating a whole copy of that map every time you call this function because it's not only going to copy all the dynamic storage for the map, all the key value pair storage, but it's going to copy all the keys and all the values. So that's a hundred thousand uh, string keys and a hundred thousand string values and then plus all the storage to manage the the uh, red black tree that manages the map so that's a lot of work going on just to be able to call this function with that argument so if you were instead of writing a generic function <coughs> excuse me if you were writing so if you weren't writing a generic function, you were writing a specific function for that data structure, of course you wouldn't pass it by value. You would pass it by constant reference so that all we're passing essentially in as a pointer to that data structure rather than an entire deep copy of the data structure. But how do you write a generic function such that it's passing by value for arguments that are cheap like int or float to pass by value? Because conversely, we don't want to pass our int or float by a constant reference because now for a value that fits in entirely within a machine word, we're passing a pointer and having to go through that pointer to get access to that data. And that's an unnecessary indirection and it, that can be hostile to your cache and it can be very detrimental to performance. So it's kind of the opposite performance problem instead of the performance problem being where having to spend all this time copying all this data to create a copy of the value to pass into this function. The problem is that the, the value itself is so small that going through an extra level of indirection is costly to access the data. So how do we get the best of both worlds with a generic function? And call traits is a means of solving that problem. So in generic programming, you, we often have the idea of a function that operates on types. So you have a template class that accepts a template as a, because it's a template class, it has a template parameter. That is the input type. And then we can access types declared by that template class, nested types, and that is the output of the template function. So call traits essentially acts like a function that has an input type and gives you an output type. So they have actually four different type functions that are declared within call traits. There's a type function that gives you, for a given t, selects the appropriate value type. There is a uh, type function that given a t gives you the appropriate reference type, another one that gives you the appropriate const reference type, and the one we've been discussing is this parameter type. 
So, th you know, the description here says defines a type that represents the quote unquote best way to pass a parameter of type T to a function. Now, it'll be, uh, that was a, like a kind of a lot of very abstract talk. So let's go look at some actual code to understand more what's going on here. Uh, so let go set this guy to be our startup project. So um, I've got a type that's, you know, it's just a arbitrarily created type that, you know, is quote unquote expensive to pass by value. Here's just a plain old regular function that I've written specific to this type. So this is a, a stream insertion operator for this person class. And here I've got my generic function that, you know, I'm going to call print on things of arbitrary type. I don't, I don't know what they are in advance. So I'm going to have to figure out what the right way is to the correct type to use for a parameter for whatever this T is. So I can access the dependent or the, the output of this type function. I pass the T in to the type function. The nested type is called param type. That gets me the, the output type of the type function. And because this name is nested inside something that depends on a template argument, I need to use the type name keyword here to tell the compiler this name refers to a type. It does not refer to a data element or a cl or something that is not a type. Uh, and my my print function here is just going to use a stream insertion uh, operator, which I've defined for my person struct up here. Now, I can simplify this a little bit using C++ 11's type alias. So I can, uh, uh, unlike a type def, a type alias can be parameterized by a template parameter. So I can take this stuff out here, which only depends on T, and I can shorten that to just be parameter of T. And then I'm going to do some queries on various types to, uh, to kind of get a better understanding of how this type function is working. So I'm using static assert. I'm using std is same from the type traits header as part of the standard library. And uh, the nested value member here is a Boolean that will be true if the two template arguments are considered to be the same type. So if I pass a plain old int, this param type type function from call traits, it says the, the best way to uh, accept that, accept a plain int as a function argument is to accept it as a, an int const, a constant int. If I pass a pointer to an int, the best way to accept that is a constant pointer to an int. So the pointer is constant, not the thing that the pointer points to. So the integer is not constant, but the pointer that points to the integer is constant. If I pass in a person, which is this struct, right? I don't want to pass that person in by value. I don't want to, I want to pass that in as a reference. And the type function evaluates to a const reference or a reference to a constant person. Now you can also use these other type functions from call traits. Um, if I have a reference and I need, if I have an arbitrary input argument of type T and I need to take a reference to it, well, I don't want to take a reference of an existing reference. So this reference function either gives the input type back if the type was already a reference, but if it's not a reference, like plain int, this type function will add the reference to it. And similarly for const reference, it'll take whatever this type is and take a reference to it if it's not already a reference and make it a const reference. And down here you can see I'm calling this print function with int and then I call it again with uh, with person and um, one note here is that just due to the way that I've written this print function, it, it can't deduce that T here is uh, person or int, whatever. So that's why I had to specifically say call print of person or print of int. 
if I wanted to get fancier, I could write this function in such a way that it, it, the uh, template argument deduction for t would work, and then I could, um, you know, do a little an extra layer of indirection there to get t deduced properly, but still have it accepted by the uh, param type func as as a type of the param type function. Um, but we're just trying to demonstrate what's going on here. So uh, these static asserts uh, are, you know, for these type functions, try to understand them in your code. Um, if it's a, if it's a little bit confusing and you're not sure why you're getting, you know, a compile error that you uh, didn't expect or something like that, an easy way to do essentially a compile time unit test on these little type functions is to use static assert. And uh, in this case, where we have a function that takes a type and returns a type, so this is the type we are expecting, and this is the type we are asking for from the type function, and where you stood is same to say, you know, are these two types the same? And uh, I didn't turn on um, compiler flags in my CMake lists here to force use of C17, so static assert. And before C++17 requires a message string as a second argument. Uh, so if we build this, uh, everything builds fine, which means all these static asserts succeeded. So it means all these types on the left that we expected are what came out of these type functions that we invoked on the right. And if we run this program, oops, we get uh, it output 5 from the first call to the print function and then it invoked our stream insertion operator for a person struct to output uh, a person from the second invocation. So, param type probably the most common one you would use but accessing the reference or const reference uh, type function from call traits can also be handy. Um, if you, you wouldn't bump into this unless you are writing generic functions that have to operate on a wide variety of types. It's perfectly acceptable if you know all your types are heavyweight and not something small like an int. It's perfectly acceptable to write a generic function, you know, something like, you know, template, oops, caps lock, template, type name t, print2, std ostream stir, and take the value as a const reference. This is, this is there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that if you know that all your t's are heavyweight and and therefore const reference to the t is the appropriate thing to do. But when you are the author of a generic library and you're providing generic functions or generic classes you don't get to choose any constraints on the t. Right, they could be using ints, they could be using floats, they could be using some heavyweight structure like a map. So call traits lets you um, deal with those variations in a in a nice way. All right, so next, like I said, these these facilities they're kind of it's kind of a grab bag. They're kind of all over the place. Um, compressed pair. So in the standard library is std pair, and std pair takes uh, two types and holds a, a tuple of an instance of each of those types. Now it um, holds them as members, so if one of the types is empty, then there can be a little bit of wasted space holding that empty member. And you might ask yourself, why? Why would you have an empty member and it? it Again, it comes up when you've got things like um, inheritance hierarchies or lists of types that are coming from generic programming and you're kind of expanding a list of types into a class that holds each member of a type and you kind of get to the end and the list is empty. So you got to have something. You can't have no type. You can't have nothing there. You got to have something there. So you have a type that holds nothing in order to handle the empty case. But a disadvantage of pair is because it holds the data of the two types as members, if one of the members is empty, there's still storage allocated for that empty member. 
Now in C++, there's a thing called the empty base class optimization, which is if you have a derived class that derives from a class that declares no data members, maybe it just declares functions um, you know, that don't require any member data, or uh, for whatever reason, it doesn't have any member data. So if the base class is empty, then C++ guarantees that there's no storage allocated in the layout of the derived class for the empty base class. So wouldn't it be nice if we had a version of pair that didn't allocate any space for the layout of the pair when one of the members was empty? One of the types in the pair was empty. And that's the idea behind compressed pair. Now, um, again, these libraries have been around for a while. This one doesn't, uh, it's, this it says 2001 down here. I'm not sure if that's just the date of the documentation or the date uh, when this class was created. But if you search around on GitHub for compressed pair, you will find a bunch of people that have their own implementations of compressed pair. So just because Boost has one doesn't mean it's the only one. Uh, and because there are design choices in uh, compressed pair, you may prefer one of those other implementations instead of the one provided by Boost. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that at all. So just to demonstrate this, here we have an empty class. We have a derived class that's deriving from the empty class. To the derived class has a data member. So the size of this derived class should be exactly equal to the size of the storage required to store this int because the base class is empty and the empty base class optimization says we don't need to allocate any space in the storage layout for our derived class because of the empty base class optimization. So again, we're going to use some static asserts here. Uh, utility is where you get pair from, if you standard pair, uh, if you weren't aware of that. So inside here we're just saying hey the uh, size of a standard pair of two ints should be the same as the size of just two ints on their own we're not specifying any magic padding or alignment or anything like that so we just expect the size of a pair should be the same as the size of the two things that are in the pair now an empty base class all by itself or a, rather an empty class all by itself still has some storage allocated because you can't have a region of memory of zero length. There has to be some region of memory corresponding to an instance of any type. And even though this struct doesn't declare any data members, all by itself it has to have something. On my compiler it happens to be one byte, uh, in a debug build at least. Um, however, our derived class should be exactly the same size as an int because of the empty base class optimization. Now, for std pair, which does not uh, use this compressed pair idiom, right? It, it's holding these data types as members, not as base classes, so it can't exploit the empty base class optimization. Uh, a, a std pair of two empties should just be twice the size of a regular empty because it's holding two structs, but a pair of two derives, a std pair of two derives, is the, it should be the size of two ints. And again, these are all static asserts, so they're all being verified at compile time. <coughs> Excuse me. Now down here, I've just made a, again, using a um, template uh, type alias to get you know some uh, a shorter name for a compressed pair so just like a std pair if we have a compressed pair of two ints that's the size of two ints but if we have a compressed pair of an int and this empty class it only uses the size the, the the storage is the same as the size as the single int so the empty base class optimization got exploited so the compressed pair when one of the members of the pair had no data, it defaulted to the size of the storage layout of the other 
element in the pair. And it doesn't matter whether the empty thing is first or last. And if we have two empty elements in this pair, then there's still some storage, again, because you, you can't have an instance of an object of zero bytes. There has to be at least one byte allocated to it so that it has an address, right? An instance of an object has an address, even if that object has no data members. It's that the object has identity, which is its address, so it has to have at least one byte inside there. Now, when you uh, do a release build, uh, you know, it might get padded out to a word or what, you know, th there's other constraints on the actual size, which is why I'm not comparing size of empty to a number. I'm just comparing it saying it's not equal to one. I'm not saying it has to be one. It, it has to be at least one. So it has to be bigger than zero. So if we um, want to access the members of this compressed pair, there's a member function called first and a member function called second. Now, now this is different from std pair. A std pair just stores the two things as members, and they're just accessible as the names of those members. So std pair of int int, you know, uh, g. You say g dot first and g dot second to reference the members of std pair. But to reference the members of a boost compressed pair, you use these member functions. And if we run this little code, again, these static asserts are, they're not required for this code to function correctly. They're just, they're, I just put them in there so we can understand what's happening with these types as we supply different template parameters. And we can see that the first one ended up being a derived of 42 and the second one ended up being an empty and that's because I wrote uh, these stream inserter functions here that if it was of type empty we're gonna insert just the literal string empty with two curly braces and if it was a derived we'll insert derived with the value that's inside the derived class so compressed pair you might think well that's a lot of work to go through something to just maybe save one byte. But if you have millions of entries in a data structure, or even hundreds of thousands, when you get into very large data sets, every byte that you can save can contribute to improved performance because now you're taking fewer cache lines to hold a certain number of data elements and the more cache coherency you get, the higher your performance is going to be because you're not going to have to go out to the slower main memory in order to fetch the data, in order to operate on it, and so on. Now, I've included a link here to this type pair. Um, this implementation of pair, type pair, um, he implemented the same idea but with a, a an API that's cl that's closer to std pair and um, it's a little bit different from boost compressed pair so just be aware for some of these you know and he shows some benchmarks here on you know using std pair versus using this tight pair so it's you know this is cycles going up so lower is better so using a compressed pair he got better performance because again it's using less memory and you get better uh, you can get more if, if the, your data elements are continuous contiguous in memory you can get more data elements into fewer cache lines so that's a uh, compressed pair um, as I say you know there when if it doesn't matter it doesn't matter just you stood pair but if you end up in a situation where it does matter then it can make a difference and like most you know components in C++ you know it's you know when you when do you use the fancy component well you use the fancy component when it matters if it doesn't matter just use std pair you know uh, measure before you decide that it matters measure performance if if uh, performance is one of your requirements okay now this next one we're gonna look at it's probably the most complicated one conceptually of these different components hanging out in boost utility so if we go back over here to boost utility
So that was compressed pair that we looked at. This next one, in place factory. Now, this one took a little bit of uh, thinking on my part to get a working example. And it didn't help that there was a bug in the documentation here. These pointer arguments should be pointer to const and not just not pointer to a mutable for the for this little snippet to work. We'll see that in a second here. But what's the idea behind this? Well, if you have a container, and uh, let's say this container, it's not a fixed size container, so it's not like std array, it's more like std vector, but it, for whatever reason you've written your own custom container, it's allocating chunks of raw memory that is uninitialized storage. And what we need to do is put elements of a certain type into that storage, and we want to avoid uh, either because the types we have are not copyable or because the copy operation is itself is expensive we want to avoid copying the objects into the container what we want to do is construct the objects in place in the container now if you haven't uh, done that before it's the um, Part of the C++ language that enters into the picture is so-called placement new, placement delete, uh, or and, and there's a um, a way to destroy an object in place. We'll see examples of the syntax for this. So the idea is we're going to allocate a chunk of raw storage. It's uninitialized, so it's full of junk, and we're going to construct the object right on the uninitialized storage instead of constructing the object elsewhere and copying it over the uninitialized storage uh, either because the copy operation is expensive so it's more performant to construct it directly on top of the uninitialized storage or maybe the types in our container can't be copied and you might say to yourself, like, you know, well, that seems kind of dumb. Why would I have a type that can't be copied? Well, you probably have already used one. It's called std unique pointer. Unique pointer is not copyable. So if you want to have a container of unique pointers, you can construct them in the memory of the container, but you can't copy them. So, um, that you know not being copyable it imposes some constraints on how this container works both because we have to avoid copy operations but also because if we grow the size of this container we have to kind of chain together the chunks that of raw storage that represent the total container because we can't reallocate a chunk of memory to make it bigger and then copy the elements over from the old chunk to the new chunk because the elements are not copyable. So the idea of in place factory uh, it's very similar to using in place back on a std vector uh, or I believe there's an in place member for maps as well but for for vector it's definitely called in place underscore back and the idea there is instead of calling pushback with a copy of the object so when you call pushback you supply an instance of the object that is copied into the vector and the argument if it's like a temporary it gets destroyed so we could be invoking the constructor and the destructor multiple times in order to get an object onto a vector because there's could be temporaries involved and the vector with pushback is always doing a copy of the value with in place back instead of supplying the value as the argument to pushback you supply the uh, the arguments to in place back are the arguments to the constructor of the type that's being put into the vector. So if it's a vector of if we, you know our little person class that we have from the previous example which had an age and a name. So instead of 
supplying a value of that I've constructed of type person that has an age and a name. I supply the age and the name directly to in place back and place back takes its arguments, which is a variadic uh, bag of template arguments. So it's a template parameter pack and place back is a variadic template member function of std vector. It takes a pack of arguments which it then perfectly forwards to the constructor of the type that's in the container and it constructs that instance in place over top of the uninitialized storage that's used inside std vector. So some of these concepts uh, have appeared in the standard library in place back is a uh, an addition to the standard library it wasn't around in 2001. <coughs> Excuse me, but you may need to implement your own container or you may need to um, manage your own storage. Maybe the memory that you're copying into isn't just any old random memory. Maybe it's a piece of shared memory between two processes. What have you, there are times when you need to implement your own containers. But if we look at their example here, um, you have some type that you're going to put into your container and the type has arguments for its constructor. Now if you wanted to implement the idea of constructing it directly on the uninitialized storage, you could add a member function to your container that took the same signature as the constructor of the type in the container and uh, that's what they're doing down here so here is in this case their container just holds one element but you could generalize this to you know a dynamically sized array of elements or a linked list of of blocks of elements each with a certain number of elements in per block but for to, to make the example simpler they've just chosen to hold one element inside their container so what they've done is they've added to the constructor for the container the signature of the arguments that would be passed to the constructor of the type that's being held in the container. And then they're doing, um, an you know, in this case, they're just doing an allocation, but um, we'll see how uh, placement new would be used to... Uh, create this initialize this object by calling its constructor but calling it calling the constructor in such a way that it the constructor operates on memory that's already been allocated if we do new it kind of combines the two operations together it allocates the storage and then it invokes the constructor on the newly allocated storage but you can see that if you had you know suppose you had a polymorphic type hierarchy and this container has to contain um, elements of different these different polymorphic types that all share a common base class you'd have to start writing all these different overloads for these different signatures of the different polymorphic types and you'd have to start allocating the different polymorphic types and this quickly explodes and moreover you end up with a container here that's not reusable for different types it can only function for the the specific type that it understands with these overloaded signatures so the idea in, in this uh, in-place factory is they give you, there's kind of uh, two ways to do it. There's this style where the constructor is a, um, a template function. It's, perhaps it's easier to look at the code that I've written here. I think it is. Okay. So let, let's get concrete because the problem is in that documentation, it, it's kind of abstract and the code isn't complete. So it's kind of hard to see all the working pieces together. So here is the type that I'm going to hold in my container. It has a constructor that takes two arguments that it uses to initialize its two data members. And down here is my container. I have a default constructor. I have a destructor, which we will talk about in a second. I have a template, const a, a templatized con uh, constructor for this container. 
So it's it's a takes an arbitrary type and it constructs that type in place. Uh, and I have some helper functions here that use the two mechanisms provided by boost. One is called an in-place factory and the other one is called a typed in-place factory. So what is the general idea of this mechanism here? The idea is that instead of providing overloaded signatures in my container that understand all the signatures of the elements I'm going to construct in my container, I move the initializing arguments and the, the, the details of that signature into a factory function. So here, uh, for the, for the, there's two types of factory functions that are provided by in-place factory. There's one where the factory function is a template member function. So, in, so here's the factory and I'm applying a template member function and the template argument to that member function is point and I am constructing I'm calling the factory with an address and a type and I'm telling it construct that type with the saved arguments in the factory at that address so this this uh, factory instance that comes in has captured the arguments to the constructor for point in my case it has captured them and when I ap call apply on the factory it uses the passed in address to construct a point from the saved uh, constructor arguments at that address. The difference with the uh, typed in place factory is that I can just call apply. I don't need to uh, supply a, uh, a, a, a template parameter there because the type and the arguments are both captured in the typed in place factory. And you might be asking like what's what's this extra little goofiness here? Um, this is just a way uh, this in place factory base over here is declared and <clears throat> they've done it in kind of crazy boost preprocessor macros but uh, let's just go back. Let's just go back to the code where we're calling it. The in-place factory base is a base class of all the uh, template in-place factory instances that we create, and we'll see how to create one in a second. So this uh, extra parameter here, it's just used as a way to get a distinct, two distinct overloads of the construct function so that when I uh, call construct up here it takes the thing that came in and then it takes the address of the thing the address of the thing will either be a pointer to an in factory in place factory base or it will be a pointer to a typed in place factory base so it's used as a way to delegate to either this construct function or this construct function because the bodies are different and they have to uh, call invoke the apply method differently depending on the type of the factory <clears throat> so, uh, I've, I've also got a, a build method here that lets me, um, it, it's just calling construct in such a way that I can do it from a, a member function after I've constructed the container. We Up here we did it when we were constructing the container. Down here I can do it after I've constructed an empty container and I want to build a point inside it. Uh, this just gets me access to the storage. Now. Mm. To get uninitialized storage, we can't call new with some type because it's going to invoke the constructor. So we have to do new of care. If it if we're newing up a primitive type like care or int, no constructor is invoked. The storage is allocated, but it is uninitialized. So I'm going to initialize. I'm going to allocate a care array that's big enough to hold my type and then the uh, crazy chain of static casts is because the type of this thing is care star any pointer can be statically cast to void star and then any void star can be cast back to point star and that's just because I've 
I wrote this down here as a point star for my storage. Uh, if I if I'd kept this as a void if I'd put that as a void star, you know, then I wouldn't need to do any of this static cast business. Okay, so the idea is we have a container. It's going to accept a factory. The factory is going to capture the constructor arguments to our uh, type, and it may also capture the type if it's a typed in place factory. We can use either one. It just depended on how we we're going to call that apply method that's on the factory. So here's an example of using the in place factory where the type is not specified. I'm just capturing the arguments. That's why we had to supply the type up here because it wasn't captured as part of the factory, just the arguments. We constructed this container with a single point. We'll print out what was in that container. And down here, we've got in place where we're using the typed in place factory. So the factory captures the type via a template argument, and it captures the arbitrary list of constructor arguments. And we build the container, print it out just, just like we did the other one. Now, I mentioned that we need to call the constructor of these types with the address of the uninitialized storage. Now you don't see it here in my code and that's because it's down inside these factories. If we drill into one of these factories, here we see what's called the placement new. So this placement new, I mentioned that if regular new does the allocation of the storage that's uninitialized and then it invokes the constructor with the address of the uninitialized storage to construct the object on the storage that was allocated. Placement new does the second part but not the first part. So it does the constructing but it doesn't do the allocating. So this apply member function here in the, the in this case we're looking at the um, looking at the one that's the typed in place factory so if we look at this member function here we're doing placement new so we are constructing an object on the address of that uninitialized storage right this is the storage that's the address at which we will construct this object when we call apply and it's going to do some preprocessor macro craziness to get at the arguments that need to be passed, the list of arguments that need to be passed to the constructor for our type t. In my case, it's a point, and it needs to accept two ints. Now, you can tell this is kind of an older library because it's using all this uh, boost preprocessor macro stuff. So this is like a C++ 98 way of doing things. In C++11, you've got variadic templates, and you, you know, so the mechanism becomes simpler. But you know, it all still works. It all amounts to the same. The variadic template business essentially amounts to um, syntactic sugar for doing the same thing as the boost preprocessor expansion stuff is doing. It just has the advantage of uh, it, it's faster to build in in. Uh, compile terms because there's less tokens to parse. It's not you know creating all these uh, variations of this class with you know first with uh, zero template arguments and then with one template argument and then with two template arguments. So variadic templates are the better way to go. But this is a an older library. It's it, this approach still works, but it would be you know wouldn't be a bad idea if somebody came in to this in place factory and updated it to use uh, variadic templates instead of the boost uh, preprocessor expansion. Uh, if we look at the other template apply, uh, it, it's doing the same thing. So placement new, that's how we got it initialized at our storage. How, did we, how do we tear it down? Well, you have to invoke the destructor for the 
type in the container and I could have made my container here a template class but I'm just making it a fixed uh, container for a, a type point so we have to invoke the destructor at this address now normally you, you don't explicitly call the destructor but it's a member function like any other and we can invoke it uh, the only wrinkle is that after we've destroyed this function by or after we've destroyed this instance of the point class by calling its destructor we can't do anything with this stuff thinking it's uh, you know a valid object it's not a valid object anymore now it's just raw storage so we can do array delete on the character array that corresponds to that storage so this array delete corresponds to the opposite of this array new down here that got us our uninitialized storage so when we destroy the container we first have to manually destroy any instances that we created with placement new because otherwise they won't be properly torn down as objects and then we can delete the storage that we created so what does that all look like if we look if we run this in place factory I edited some code so it had to build it oops again a little debugging going on we look at the output you know so the first point had values 1 and 2 and the second point had values 3 and 4 which is exactly what we constructed them with whether we used the in place factory or the typed in place factory method this little boost in place this is just a helper function to create an in place factory and again they're using uh, anytime you see boost underscore pp that's the boost preprocessor library used to uh, expand things out using the preprocessor and it's what people did before they had variadic templates these boost preprocessor library to um, you know, expand things out up to a certain number of template arguments so in place factory why would you use this well you would use this as I said maybe the storage that you have to construct objects into is some kind of special storage maybe it's shared memory maybe it's a specific piece of your maybe you're operating in an embedded environment and the memory that you're constructing objects in it's at a fixed address you can't just construct it anywhere you're not constructing it on the heap typically an embedded um, piece of code isn't even using the heap they're not using a dynamic heap everything is located at a fixed point in memory but how do you get if you have these fixed regions of memory how do you put object extract abstractions on top of them well you do that by using placement new to initialize objects at a specific location and then when you're tearing things down you invoke the destructor explicitly if it were uh, an embedded application and the memory was fixed in the hardware memory map I wouldn't be you know I wouldn't be doing the array new and array delete because the memory it's at a fixed location and fixed size it's not dynamically allocated but uh, I may have decided to put a container wrapper around a, you know a chunk of memory and each you know it's actually an array of instances in the hardware and I've got an, a, a class that I've created for each of those instances and I want to allocate this fixed size container and I want to initialize those instances on there um, you might say like you know why would hardware do that and if you've looked at implementing things like a USB device you find out that there's a lot in order to get a USB device talking over USB there's a lot of data structures that have to be initialized and they're all at fixed locations in the memory map and you fill out those fixed locations with certain values at certain offsets in order to configure the different parameters of a USB device and then that tells the hardware what kind of device it's going to pretend to be when it communicates over USB with a host or with a device so um, it's actually more common than you than you might think if you haven't done embedded stuff before so in place factory that's when you would use it you call this in place helper function to package up the constructor arguments 
to pass to the container so it can do the factory apply with the packed up arguments to get an instance created at a specific address. Okay, so that one's that was kind of the most complicated component we're going to look at. The last one we will look at if we go back here. Uh, and I did mention, I'll just mention it again in this example. In this example, I got to file a bug on this. This code that they wrote here, notice that this constructor takes a const reference expert and it takes expert passes expert as the first argument to construct and it takes the address of expert as the second argument to construct but as shown here in this example these are not pointers to const they are pointers to non const so when I copy pasted this example into my code it didn't work at first. I had, it had a bit of a head scratcher figuring that out. So I got to file a bug against that. But just be aware that if you're going to copy and paste this code, you will get an error until you make this a pointer to const in place factory base and const typed in place factory base. All right. So the last one we're going to look at is operators. And again, these components are kind of all over the map. But you know, when you need them, you need them, and if you don't, you don't. So it's just handy to know about them for the, when you do need them. The idea here is in C++, you can override all the, um, well, not all. There's a couple of operators you can't override. But you can oper over, sorry, you can over ride, override the many of the operators for a type. Now, you can't override the operators for something like int, but for your own types, you can. However, there's a lot of boilerplate in defining the full set of operators for a class that represents something like, you know, a numerical type. Here, they're calling it my int, but suppose it wasn't just a plain int. Suppose it was, you know, an arbitrary precision int that you've gotten from some arbitrary precision library. So if you want to implement the full suite of operators that make sense for, say, an integral numerical type, that's uh, comparison, less than, less than or equal, equal, greater than, greater than or equal, not equal. You've got the uh, additive operators, so you've got addition, operator plus, you've got uh, plus equals, You've got minus, you got minus equals, and then for multiplication operators, you've got multiply, you got um, you know st operator star, uh, star equal, divide, divide equal, and then you've got uh, modulus operator percent and percent equal. You may have bitwise operators, so you've got or, or equal, and, and equals. These are bitwise and, bitwise or. You've got bitwise exclusive or. Uh, you've got increment and decrement. Uh, you may have both um, pre pre increment and post decrement, and pre pre increment, post dec post increment, pre decrement, and post decrement. So that's a lot of boilerplate to write. Now, if you are tricky you can write a few base operators and then write all the other operators in terms of the base. So for instance, uh, operator less can be used to write operator greater equal by saying, you know, x is less than y if x, or sorry, x is greater than or equal to y if x is not less than y. So it, you can write that's what they're saying here. X greater than or equal to Y is equivalent to not X less than Y. So it turns out you can write a small number of operator member functions and then you can inherit from something that will define all the other operator member functions in terms of the few that you've defined. And that's the idea here between
uh, behind the uh, operator's header. So, <coughs> excuse me, here, their example is, you know, we're going to define all the operators. And we can define all the operators in terms of this fundamental base set. So this uh, inherit from boost operators of my int, this is the so-called curiously recurring template pattern where the class that you're defining is an argument to a template base. And if we define these functions, then we can get all the rest. Now, it doesn't always make sense for all of the operators to be defined for a certain type. Uh, usually, you probably leave out the bitwise operators. You know, for instance, the bitwise operators don't usually make sense for floating point types. So maybe you want to leave those out. What if you just want some of the operators but not the others? And the way that they give you the mechanism to do that is that you can derive from subsets that let you get a particular set of operators and the requirements are that you implement something that can be used to express the other operations. So for instance less than comparable. You can get greater than, less than or equal, and greater equal by defining less than. Now notice that the signature of this operator greater than is it's taking two arguments of the same type. If you want to enable comparison between different types, then there's a template base that takes two arguments. So I could enable less than or equal comparing between you know my int and my float. And the requirements are that in order to implement these operators you need to have these expressions have to make sense. Uh, here they're implementing not equals in terms of equality. So not equal can be implemented by just saying you know the two things are not equal if it's a not of the two things being equal. You know so it's simple um, expansion there. Now so you can pick these individual pieces to get the appropriate operators and the requirements are shown for what you need to implement in order to get the uh, results. So, and you, you can see here the requirements uh, for subtractable you implement minus equal so you implement the version that modifies in place in order to get the version that subtracts two things and produces a new value. Uh, similarly, there's dividable, moddable for, for remainder operator, orable for bitwise or, etc., etc. So, let's take a look at the example for that. Make this guy the guy we're running and take a look over here. So, I've got uh, what I call fancy int. It can be constructed from a, a plain int. And then here's the set of functions that I need to implement in order to get all the other operators supplied by boost operators. I Again, a uh, minor wrinkle in their documentation, in their example rather. Uh, you notice here in this detailed table there's left shiftable and right shiftable which require you to implement the modifying shift operators for your type but up here in their example at the top they did not show the modifying shift operators in their little my int class I think those two just got overlooked or perhaps they were added to the library later and nobody came back and updated this little code block. So uh, in my code I've implemented everything and this is just a, a simple int right so I can just delegate to the operations on the built-in int 
I've got a conversion operator to convert back from my fancy int to a plain int. And uh, we will collapse this for now. So for my fancy int, I've just got a simple little thing here that's just checking, you know, this value should be equal to whatever this expression is. And if they're not equal, then it will throw an exception. So um, I should be equivalent to 10 and adding the fancy int i and j should be equivalent to 12 and so on. Now, I did another example here where, as, you know, kind of represent a kind of semi-realistic complex number class. This is not appropriate <laughs> multiply and divide for complex numbers, but it serves to illustrate the point of complex numbers they're kind of floating point quality quantities. It doesn't make sense to provide shift or bitwise operators, but I kind of want the other stuff. So less than comparable, equality comparable, addable, subtractable, multipliable, dividable, moddable, incrementable, and decrementable. Those are all reasonable operations to, sub to apply to a complex number type. And again, I implement a handful of base functions and I get all the other functions by virtue of this inheritance. Now, you may have noticed if you had eagle eyes that I'm doing private inheritance here, and it turns out that's okay. Uh, I didn't look into the details of how they managed to pull that off, but you'll see in here in the documentation they are noting that you know private inheritance is perfectly okay here. Um, and you can see that because in my little test thing, I'm invoking operator plus, which I did not define. I defined operator plus equal. So I'm invoking operator plus. If we drill in with the IDE, we see that it comes into this macro that implements an operator. You know, they factored it out into some macros just to avoid boilerplate. So this thing, this binary operator commut commutative, so it can be x plus b or b plus x, doesn't matter, where they've implemented the op, you know, which is an argument to this macro. And you, again, to cr creative use of the preprocessor to eliminate repetitive boilerplate, but we don't need to understand all that in order to understand how to use this and get all the remaining operator functions that we would like on our types by implementing a few base operator overrides. Okay, so that wraps up our kind of little whirlwind tour of the utility library. You know, handy things to know about. If you need it, you need it. And if you don't, you don't. Uh, don't introduce complexity into your code if you don't need it but when you get in that situation where you need that it's handy to know that these things exist so you don't have to go and recreate it yourself even if some of these library components are implemented using you know older techniques like I said kind of serious abuse of the preprocessor uh, boost preprocessor library there to expand things out and get uh, template functions can take an arbitrary number of arguments up to some fixed maximum before you had variadic templates. It's okay. Um, any questions before we wrap things up? Okay, then we will just end it there. Thanks.